Hello, I'm Pastor Timothy James Sparrow, and I serve as the founding and lead pastor of a non-denominational church here in Bloomington Normal called The Tab. And I would like to invite you to join us for worship some Sunday morning at 10 a.m. The Tab is located at 1845 West Hubby Avenue in Normal, Illinois. I also want to invite you to visit our ministry website at thetab.tv. There's lots of wonderful resources and ministry there for you to take advantage of. Thank you for being with us today on this Tab Telecast. Here is this week's message. It's, uh, I, I've, I've got mixed emotions. It's good to see you. But uh, uh, I was really hoping the rapture was going to take place last week. And uh, how many of you were looking forward to the rapture? Yeah, I was. And, uh, you know, I got to thinking about that and, and talking to a lot of, lot of, of uh, good people like you this past week. They were also looking forward to the rapture. Uh, uh, during the Feast of Tabernacles, Rosh Hashanah, we talked about that last Sunday. And uh, I was reminded of Paul's words. You know, Paul said to the first century church, you know, I desire to go to be with God in heaven. I desire to go to be with the Lord. How many of you desire to go to be with the Lord? Amen. But Paul said, it, it's, it's better for you that I stay. It's better for you that I, I want to go to heaven. Uh, I mean, y'all just need to know option A, go to heaven. Option B, stay here on earth. Option A. I'm out of here. See you later, alligator. I'm gone. I mean, y'all need to know that, right? You get that option. We're, I'm, I'm, I'm going to heaven, right? Uh, but for you, Paul said, I would rather go to heaven and be with the Lord. But for your sake, I'm going to remain. I'm going to stay here. And I got to thinking about that for in light of, uh, of, of what didn't happen last Sunday, the rapture of the church, the catching away of the church, is, uh, is you know what? Uh, it's better. Better, even though all of us would prefer to go to go to be with God in heaven, it's better for the world that we stay. Because once the church is raptured, what happens? All hell breaks loose. The seven-year tribulation of this world begins to take place. It's better. They don't even know it. I want to go up to a sinner and say, you're, you're lucky I'm here. You're lucky I'm here, baby. Because if we're gone, I mean, it's get ready. You know, button down the hatches, tighten your belt, and hold on, because the world's going to go to hell in a handbasket, literally. It's better that we stay. And uh, the Bible also says it's God's, uh, God's patience works redemption. God is so patient. Uh, I mean, I, I just, I stand in awe. I thank God for His patience. How many of you are grateful that God is patient with you? Lord, thank you for with dealing with me and my craziness from time to time. And just thank you for being merciful and patient and working with me, you know, and, 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 and all of that. And God in His patience is working salvation for the world and for souls. Think about it this way. Again, just, just let me kind of talk about some things here before we begin our message. Everything, I shouldn't say everything, let's put it as a percentage, 90 to 95 percent of everything that you and I do here on earth, listen to this, we can do better in heaven. We can worship better in heaven. We can love better in heaven. We can pray better in heaven. We can uh, do relationships better in heaven. Uh, your body is going to be better in heaven. Your emotions are better in heaven. Your mental health is better in heaven. Are you with me? Everything that we do in this life, for the most part, we can eat better in heaven. Amen. Hallelujah. Right? No calories in heaven. Amen. Right? We, we can drink better in heaven. Everything. We can play better. You know, people say, well, what are we going to do in heaven? What we're doing down here, there's going to be a lot of it in heaven. You know, there's going to be work, and there's going to be sports, and there's going to be theater, and there's going to be music, and show. I mean, everything. We can do better in heaven. And if that is true, which it is, then the question is, why are we still here? Why doesn't God just take us? Matter of fact, the day you get saved, think about this. The moment you get saved, why didn't God just rapture? You rapture, you just, you're gone. Because... It's better for them that we're here to witness to them, to bring many more people, what, 
to glory, to faith in Jesus Christ, and to take as many people with us. Amen? That, I believe, is why uh, the rapture has not happened yet for 2,000 years. Matter of fact, if you read your Bible, the first century Christians believed that the rapture was going to take place in their day and time. 2,000 years ago, people believed in the rapture. People believed Jesus was coming back. Matter of fact, there was a heretical, I'm, I'm, I'm just kind of talking, is this okay? I know you got your message notes and they're burning in your lap. I'll get there. I'm, I'm going to get there. I'm going to get there, Draco. Just give me some faith. There was a heresy in the first century uh, church that the rapture had already happened, that people got left behind. And Paul had to squelch that, right? Uh, so, so for 2,000 years, the church of Jesus Christ has been anticipating the rapture, the return of Jesus. But God in His patience is what? Merciful, wanting as many people to come to faith in, in Him and His Son as possible. Amen? Now, that being said, uh, we've got another year. We have another year from the Feast of, of Trumpets to the Feast of Trumpets because the, the rapture could happen next, next year. I believe, again, this is my personal belief, that the rapture is going to happen on Rosh Hashanah during the Feast of Trumpets. Biblically, I've proved that to you. Um, and, and, and no man knows the day or hour. We, we get that. But we believe that's the season. That Jesus is going to fulfill the three fall feasts and His second coming. Amen. Amen. Amen, brother. Amen. All right. <laughs> so, so we have another year. Why? Well, to to be doing some things, to be do, to be doing about, and working about the master's business. Matter of fact, let's just jump into the to the to the uh, um, the message series. We're going to continue the in between series here in October because uh, we need to understand and we need to know and to be enlightened and educated what does God want us to do between now and the rapture of the church we call it the in between time what are we to be about between now and when the rapture of the church comes Jesus said in Luke 19 13 these words occupy until I come someone said I say occupy what does occupy mean? It means to take up, to fill, to hold, and to perform the functions thereof. In, in other words, we need to be, as Christians, we need to be about the master's business. We're not to be fatalist. We're not to just sit back and let, we, you know, this whole world uh, go uh, from uh, darkness to deeper darkness and, and, and greater depths of depravity and depression and dysfunction. No, we are to what? We're to be about the master's business. We're to be about shining the light in the darkness. Amen. We're to be giving hope to the hopeless. We're to bring healing to the hurting. We're to bring what? Salvation to the lost. We're to be about the master's business in between now, someone say now, and the rapture of the church. And God just gave us an extra year to do that. God just gave us an extra year. It could happen, right? Next year. Well, and I believe, again, I, and just, you know, common sense, by common deduction, we're closer today than we've ever been to the rapture of the church. That's right. we're, we've been clo we're closer today than the last 2,000 years, amen, to the second coming of Jesus Christ. And I believe as we look at the, uh, and, and have our, our finger on the pulse of this planet and what is happening, God's apocalyptic puzzle pieces are coming together faster than we can imagine. Matter of fact, can I just kind of share something that me and the Holy Spirit kind of talked about? And I've been just by experiencing, witnessing this, and maybe you have too, let me bring this to, to your attention. Um, we are seeing answers to prayer quicker now than ever. Now, I see answers to prayer, and many of you see answers. You pray about something, it, it, you're going to get an answer. But here's what I found out. Just in the last few weeks and months, what used to take a year uh, to bring about an answer, or a month, or a decade, is being answered in a day, is being answered in an hour. I mean, we're, we're, we're the, the, why is that? Because the time is getting shorter between now and the rapture of the church. All these prayers that we're praying are, are being answered quickly, 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 quickly. If you want an answer to prayer, if you've got a need, you better ask this church to pray for you. We pray on Wednesday night. We can't keep up with all the answers, can we? Come on, Brother, brother Kevin. I mean, we pray something about Wednesday night. You, you, you tell us to pray something. We see answers. It's amazing. Amen. Now, there's still some things. I'm not saying we get everything we ask for. 
We, we, I should say, yeah, we do get everything we ask for. Yeah. I should say that. It's just a matter of time. I mean, there's some things that, that we're still believing. We're still, as a church, and you are too. And, and, but we're seeing answers to prayer quickly, quicker now than ever. Why is that? Because the time is getting short. That We don't have much time left. We, the, the end time move is happening. God is working. And, uh, and, and it's exciting. Amen. Because God has saved his best move for his last move. And, uh, and we are a part of that end time generation. Hallelujah. Someone say hallelujah. hallelujah. So we're to occupy until Jesus comes. And we've been looking at numerous things from God's word that he has instructed us, his children, to be about between now and the rapture of the church. I want to share with you today four W's, all right, four W's that you and I are to be about in the in-between times. Four things we're to be doing between now and the rapture of the church, all right? Number, the first the first W I want to share with you today is so good, so important, because we just did it. We need to be what? We need to be worshiping. We need to be worshiping. Psalm 29, verse 2 says, Ascribe to the Lord the glory do His name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of His holiness. We're to be what? We're to be worshiping God. Now, again... There is a day and time uh, that we here, of course, at the tab, worship God. That's every Sunday morning at what time? 10 a.m. Amen. 10 o'clock. We worship corporately. And we send out an invitation every week. Come and worship. As you're able, as you're available, you are invited to church. You can come worship the Lord. Why? Because that's one of the things God wants us to be doing in between now and the rapture of the church is we're to be worshiping. You want to know something that's pretty exciting? When you get to heaven, guess what you still get to do? You get to worship. Matter of fact, every vision, every, every time uh, any of the biblical authors uh, share a, an encounter with God in heaven, specifically the throne room, what's happening around the throne 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365? This. Worship. I mean, you get into God's presence that you just can't help but worship. You're like, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. I mean, I'm looking, talk about it. Talk about a band. Talk about a choir. Talk about a praise team. I mean, it's not just us as humans there. There's other creatures, living creatures worshiping God. And then you throw in a bunch of angels. Tens of thousands upon ten thousands of angels worshiping God. Well, we're not just to wait to heaven to worship God. We're to worship God now. This is important, what I'm trying to say. What we're doing is important. Uh, Hebrews 10, 25 tells us, Do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together as some are in the habit of doing, but do so even more as the day. And if you read that in your Bible, it's a capital D. What is that day? The day of Jesus' return. The closer we get to the rapture of the church, what should we do? We be what should we be doing more and more and more and more and more and more of? Worshiping. Amen. Yeah. yeah. Psalm 81 verse 9 says, you, God says, you shall have no foreign God among you. You shall not worship any God other than who? Other than me. So we're, we're instructed by the word of the Lord. We're not to worship anyone or anything other than the great God Jehovah the God of the galaxies, the Lord of the universe. Amen. He alone is worthy of worship. He alone is worthy of praise. He alone is, is worthy of our adoration. Amen. Uh, let me say it this way. When God created you and I, when God made us as human beings, he wired us to worship. The word worship is a compound word. Write this down if you've, if, you've got, if you've got some notes. The word worship means worth and ship. Worth meaning what? Value. Value and ship condition or state. God in his state and condition is so valuable, is so awesome, 
He is deserving of our worship. He alone is worthy, I should say, of our worship, of our praise, of our adoration. For who He is, number one, we worship God for who He is, and then we worship God for what He's done. We thank God for what He's done. For answer prayers, for the ways in which He, he works in your life, in my life, in our children's lives, in our grandchildren's lives, the way he, he, he works in our world. I mean, we've got testimonies. You know, there's this little storm in Florida called Hurricane, is it Ian or Ian or Ian? Yeah. And uh, uh, we, there was specific, we've got church members down there that were right in the midst of the storm that, you know, have houses. And the only thing that the damage they got was the shutters came off the, 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 that's it, shutters. Well, they just went out there and picked them up and put them back on the house. That was it. Hallelujah, brother. Praise God. My house is still standing. All I got to do is get some new screws and put the shutters back on the house. How many of you know that's, that's God's worthy of worship? We pray, God, protect the house, protect our loved ones, protect our family members. Well, I've got friends, you've got friends who live in Florida, amen. I hope you were praying for them, we were praying for them, that they would be supernaturally protected. And, uh, and they were. God is worthy of that worship, amen. Hallelujah. Uh, in, in each and every one of our lives. To worship also means, watch this now, if I can break this down, to ascribe worth, value, importance, reverence, and respect, watch this now, to someone or something. Now, again, when God created us as human beings, He wired us to worship. Every single human being on this planet, listen to this, lean into this real nice and strong for me, worship something or someone. Everybody. Everybody's a worshiper. Even the atheists are worshipers. Most atheists are worshiping themselves. How great I am. How great I am. Oh Not how great thou art. How great I am. Or how great my, you know, intelligence is. Or how, how great my job is. How great my bank account is. Boy, I'm great. See, we're wired to worship. You're going to worship something. Whether it's a little carved idol made out of wood or gold, or, or you're going to worship a rock star or a celebrity. You're going you're gonna to ascribe worth, value, importance, reverence, and all. You get in these presence of these, you know, oh, I'm in awe of this person, right? You worship them. We all worship something. Every single day you're going to worship something or someone. And we have been told by God to worship only who? Only Him. Watch your... Ooh, that's a good word. Watch your worship. Watch your worship. Watch who you're really ascribing glory and thanks and praise to. All right? Amen. God can do great things through you. Yes, He gave you a brain and gave you gifts and talents and abilities. But don't think for a second that you had anything to do with it. It's Him. He gave you those abilities to what? Bring Him worship. To give him glory by doing it. How many of you have ever seen this? This is a good, good illustration. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Have you ever seen the movie, and this is an old one, Chariots of Fire? You ever seen Chariots of Fire? If you've not seen the movie Chariots of Fire, you need to do that this afternoon before your Sunday nap. <laughs> it's a good movie. And it's about the Olympics. I can't remember what year it was, the Olympics, but there was this uh, runner named Eric Little, right? who ran for Great Britain. And he was called by God to be a missionary, to go, I believe it was to India, to be a missionary to tell you know, the Indian people about Jesus. God called him his sister, you know, to go be a missionary. But yet God gave him this gift, this ability, this talent to run, and to run fast. And there's this one line, I'm getting goosebumps just thinking about it. He's having this, you know how the brothers and sisters are. They're having these debates, heated debates, you know, like you can have with only your brother and sister, right? And she's really chewing on him. I mean, she's really giving it to him. You know, come on, you're letting God down. We're, here you are running in this Olympic Games, and we're supposed to be in India. And he said, he looks at, you know, Jenny, I think is her name, Jenny, Jenny, calm down now. 
He goes, what you don't understand is when I run, I sense his pleasure. When I run, I sense his pleasure. I'm running for his glory. I'm running for him. And when I run, it's worship to him. I'll get to India, but I got to run. See, God gives you the abilities. One of the gifts God did not give me was the gift of running. <laughs> Anybody say, come on, Owens, you, me and you, <laughs> we can do a lot of things. We can't run. <laughs> Amen. Uh, I don't think God's ever got pleasure from me running. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> God gives you gifts and abilities, to, and it's worship to him. Amen. And you sense his pleasure when you're doing it. Worship. And let me say this. This isn't just the only time that you and I are to be worshiping God. We're to be worshiping God every single day. Worship is to be a lifestyle. Worship, everything we do, we're to be worshiping the Lord. We're to be praising God every single day. Not just on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. at the tab. Psalm 95, look at this with me. Verse 6 and 7 says, Come. Let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for He is our God, and we are the people of His pasture. See that invitation? What an invitation to come, to bow down, to kneel before God in what? In worship. And why is that? Because we are His. We are His people. We are His people people, the people of his pasture. He is our shepherd and we are his sheep. And we've been given an opportunity and an invitation to come into his presence and to give him praise. That's why, by, by, by the way, uh, that's why we begin our worship. This is a worship service. We begin our worship service by doing what? By ascribing worth, by lifting up our heads and our minds and our hearts and our lives. Our vo we're lifting up our voices in song. And there, you know, it's not just we're like, no, we're not looking for filler here. Y'all know that, right? We're not, well, my God, Pastor Tim's only going to preach for 60 minutes and we got a 75 minute service. What are we going to do? <laughs> we're not looking for filler time here. We're not doing, we're not praising and worshiping God up here with the band just because we need an extra 15, 20 minutes to fill the time. No, this is strategic. Read Psalm 100. There's protocol to his presence. You don't just walk into God's presence. You don't just, you know, hop in there and hop out. If you've ever been in, in, invited into the presence of a president or a prime minister or a king, as I have and as we have as a family, there is protocol. You got to go, you got to do this and this and this and this and this and that and this and that before you get in to see the president. And oh, by the way, you're not coming in your sweatpants and t-shirt. That's dishonoring. You, you, you don't go to the White House and you're, if, you, if, you know, if you're going to go on a tour, that's all fine. But if you're there to see, come on now, the president, there's protocol. Well, how much more is there protocol in the presence of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords? Psalm 100 says, enter his gates with thanksgiving, enter his courts with praise. You come into, into his presence through what? Through worship, through praise. And we do that every single day, not just on Sunday mornings. Psalm 100, here it is. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him, oh, I love this, with depressing songs. No, come before him with what? Joyful songs. Did you notice the first song we sang today? Joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord. We're coming before God's presence with joy. Why? Because of who he is and what he's done. Well, when God starts working in your life, when God starts answering your prayers, what does it cause your heart to do? Be joyful. When you pray about something, when you need God to move and he does it, man, there's nothing like it. There's nothing like it. It's like, whoo, hallelujah. Well, what's the word hallelujah mean? Praise the Lord. Well, what, is, what are you doing when you say hallelujah? You're worshiping God. Amen. God is good. 
all the time and all the time. God is good. And He is worthy of what? Our worship. What are we, I'm talking about what are we supposed to be doing, saints, between now and the rapture of the church. We're to be worshiping. We need to put this, we need to hold Sunday mornings sacred. The, your friends and family members ought to know where you're at every Sunday morning at 10 a.m. And if they don't, then get on Facebook if you got it and check in. How hard is that? It's a testimony. Well, where, where's, uh, where's this person? That person? Well, they're at the tab. They're worshiping God. And we need to say, hey, this is, this is just what I do. This is what we're going to do. We're commanded to be worshiping God. Psalm 132. Let's look at this. Verses 7 through 8 says, let us go. Let us go to what? To His tabernacle. Let us go to His tabernacle. Let us worship at His footstool, saying, Arise, Lord, come to what? Come to your resting place. So where are we, where are we to go and worship God corporately? Where to go what? To his, to his dwelling place, to His tabernacle, to His tent, to His temple. We would say to the church, right? To what? To worship Him, to invite Him to come. We've, we prayed about that early this morning. We pray about it in our worship. Come, Holy Spirit, come to your dwelling, but come to your house. We want to meet with you. John 4, 24 says, God is spirit and his worshipers, that's us. Someone say, that's us. That's us. Must worship him, watch this now, in spirit and in truth. We're to worship, God is spirit. And here's the good news. You and I were made in whose image? God's image, right? Not just, not just, we're not just made in his image physically. In other words, what does God look like? God looks a lot like you. God looks a lot like me. God's got one head. God's got two shoulders, two elbows, two arms, two hands, two kneecaps, two legs, and ten toes. Well, how do you know that, brother? Because the Word of God tells us that. When God formed man out of the dust of the ground, what shadow did He use to form him in? His shadow. The sun was casting a uh, uh, sun on God's back, lined out there on the beach, and He carved Adam out of the dust of the ground. Read your Bible. But God didn't just create you and I physically in His image. God, watch this now. This is most important. He created us spiritually in His image. God is, what does it say? God is spirit. And guess who you are? Guess what I am? We're spirit beings. So much so that when you and I breathe our last breath, if we should do so before the rapture of the church, guess what happens to this physical body? It drops dead on the floor. But you're not dead. When you die physically, you're not dead. Your spirit and soul just pass out of your body, and you're either going up or you're going down. But you're a spirit being. You're an eternal being. You're going to live forever and ever and ever, either in heaven or in hell. Why? Because you are a spirit being made in God's image and God's likeness. Now watch this now. Not only are we to be worshiping God with our body, right, clapping our hands, our voice, right, amen, but we're to worship God where, and most importantly, with our spirit. How many of you know? Well, let's just let's just be real. Come on, someone say, "Be real, pastor. Be real. Be real. Come on, be real. Keep it real, pastor." People say all the time, "Keep it real, pastor." I say, "You can't handle real." <laughs> you, I can, I gotta, I gotta be careful how real we get here, right? But let's be real here. We can go through the motions of worship. We can come in and clap and. Raise our hands, right? We can sing. And watch this now. Your spirit, or we, we, another word for your spirit, and this may make, make better sense, is your heart. Your heart could be elsewhere. Oh, I'm in church. I'm doing all these religious things. Come on now. But my heart isn't in it. Come on. Some of you know what I'm talking about. we got a whole bunch of pretenders in the church, capital C. So much so that one of Jesus' end time sayings, I think we're going to get to it this month. Jesus is going to, there's a bunch of people going to be standing before Jesus on that day, and, and they're not going to get into heaven. 
And they're going to say to Jesus, but we did this in your name, and we did, I went to church, and I clapped my hands, Pastor, and I raised my voice, and, and you know what Jesus says? Jesus said, I never knew you, because your heart, you never gave me your heart. You never gave me your spirit. You never gave me your soul. You just went through all the emotions, including, and this is a pretty amazing, if you read it from Jesus' word, including, you know, doing some pretty powerful stuff in his name, like raising people from the dead, healing people. Still, just because you work miracles doesn't mean you're going to heaven. Because God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in what? Spirit, heart, and then there's a second one, truth. What's truth? The Word of God. The Word of God. His way, God's way, right? And, and, and when we do it God's way, when we do it with all of our heart, oh, there's, it rings true. It rings, the, 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 the bell, the worship bell rings true, that your worship is true. It's all, you're not just pretending. You're not just going through the motions. You're not just, and this is the difference, can I say it this way, of being religious, having religion, and that's what a lot of people have, a lot of Christians have, a form of godliness, a form of religion, but deny the power thereof. They deny, you, and that's the thing. Can I be honest with you? Because some will say, keep it real, Pastor. Keep it real. Keep it real. There's nothing more dangerous than doing what we're doing. There's nothing more dangerous than handling holy things and doing holy things without your heart in it. Because you can convince yourself, just because I'm doing this or doing that, that I'm good. If your heart's not in it. Come on now. God wants our hearts more than our hands. Ooh, that's good. Hallelujah, Holy Spirit. I like that. God wants your heart, not just your hands. God doesn't want just you to sing His praises. God wants, God wants you. Amen. He wants your worship. He wants, he wants you to love on Him and to praise Him from the depths of your being. Amen. And when you do it from in here, watch this now. When we worship God in spirit with all of our heart, the hands and the, it just it overflows. It's easy. It's kind of like a relationship. Come on now, husband, wife, boyfriend, girlfriend. Come on now. You can do a bunch of, of you know, relational activities. You can go out on a date with one another. You can even live with one another. But your heart isn't in it. And it's it's empty. It's shallow. But boy, when you love that person. That you're in a relation. Come on now. Some of you know what I'm talking about. When you when your heart's in it, boy, it's man, that just that's a deep, rewarding relationship, you know? And it doesn't mean everything's gonna pop up petunias and bud roses every single day and you're gonna sing kumbaya and, and oh I love you, honey, every day. But there's something when your heart's in it, when you love your spouse, when you love your friend, boy, all the other stuff is overflow. But you can do all this other stuff, and if your heart's not in it, it's, it's shallow, right? It's empty. And God doesn't want us, if I can say it this way, to be empty worshipers. That's what we want. That's what we want to create. We want to create a culture here, and we have, I believe, at the tab, where we are worshiping God. We're not just going through a bunch of religious motions and religious duties. My land, I hope you're not here out of religious duty. If you're here out of religious duty, my friend, or you're listening to our tab, tab telecast because of religious duty, you've missed it by a million miles. You've missed it. You're handling holy things without your heart. God wants our hearts. Amen. God wants our hearts. Love. Matter of fact, Jesus said the great commandment. We began this series four or five weeks ago. The first point I said was the most important point. Is what's the first thing we're to be doing between now and the rapture of the church? We're to be loving. The great commandment is this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. Isn't that interesting? Boy, when you love God with all your heart, what is that? It's worship. Your words, oh, Lord, I love you. Oh, I just love you. And I tell you what, I've got, I have to watch myself. Because you want to know who's in the greatest danger here in this room of handling holy things without my heart being in it? This guy right here. Because I know how to do church. 
I know how to do all, I know all, I can say all the right words. Come on now, some of you have been in church so long, you know all the right words to say. You can, you, you know all the right things to do. And you know, I'm telling you the truth, it's real easy for your heart to not to be in it. And it could look like from the outside, man, you got it all together. But your heart might be a thousand miles away. You know what God wants more than anything is a relationship with you. Intimacy with you. He wants you to love him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's, that's what he wants. And boy, if, he, if we can give God that, everything else, I'll just be honest with you, comes easily. It's easy after that. Because when you're in love, everything else is easy. Sure, there's, there's more difficult days than others. I get that. But when you genuinely love somebody and care about them, it, everything else Serving them, helping them, listening to them is a whole lot easier. Amen? Amen. So the first W we're to be doing is we're to be what? Worshiping, worshiping, worshiping. Not just corporately once a week on Sunday. We're to be worshiping God every single day of our lives. Hallelujah. Amen? Look around. Find something to praise God about. It could be a sunrise if you're up early or a sunset. <laughs> we've had, by the way, we've had some pretty sunsets here lately. I mean, these, I love these harvest sunsets. They're beautiful. I just, and every, every night, I mean, I think Mindy gets tired of me saying, it. look at that sunset. Isn't God great? Wow. Let's just stop and praise Him. Okay. <laughs> praise God. Oh, wow. No artist can do it like God. Amen? Amen. I mean, just amazing sunsets here recently. That's something to worship God for. All right. Get moving, Pastor T. Here we go. Number two, the second W. Here's a good one. We're to be working. Not only are we to be worshiping, we're to be what? We're to be working for the king. We're to occupy until he comes, right? We're to be about the master's business. We're not to be sitting on our blessed assurances waiting for Jesus to just come get us. We're to be doing some things. We're to be working and laboring for the Lord. Why? Because we love Him. Amen? Amen. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10 says this, For it is by grace, someone say grace, grace. that you've been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves. It's the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. So, we are saved by God's grace through our faith, not by any works you and I do. Now, this is an entire message, probably an entire message series all into itself. The balance between grace and works. And, and you can get off on either one, either side, and get them out of balance. Right now, there's a, there's a, a camp in the, in, in the Christian church, not the small camp. Christian church, capital Christian church, that's so out of balance on the grace side that they just live like the devil and they just believe they're going to be covered by grace, which is false. And then you got the other camp over here that's so heavy on the works that, that you have to do a bunch of good things to go to heaven. Come on now, how many of you ever been taught that? That was the old church. That's kind of the church most of you and I were raised in, right? You got to do, do, do all these good works or God's not going to let you into heaven. That's wrong. You're not going to get to heaven based on your works, and you're not going to get to get to heaven based on, on anything but what? But God's grace through faith. Now watch this now. Let me put it this way. Grace makes, faith takes. Write that down. Grace makes, faith takes. Everything you and I have is because of God's grace. But we obtain it, we receive it by faith. In other words, I hate to use this image because it's a bad image, but it's the only thing I can come to. It's like that vending machine. <laughs> I mean, I've never met a vending machine I didn't like. You stand there before that vending machine and you got all the, you know, the chips and the candy bars and the licorice on the other side of the plastic. Come on now, you know, some of you are looking at me, what's a vending machine? Come on, you were using a vending machine this past week. You're standing there before the vending machine, right? Come on now, you got layers of stuff just between you and the plastic. Oh, wow. Right? It's there. 
Lots of variety behind the plastic, right? Behind the glass in the vending machine. God's, God's made and created all these blessings for us. The question is, how do we get them out of the vending machine and into our hands? Healing. Joy. Peace. Deliverance. Salvation. There's a lot. Joy. You know? Acceptance. Forgiveness. Deliver all in the vending machine, right? God's got it there. God's made it all. It's already, it's already there for you. But you're standing here empty-handed. How do we get it from there to here? How many of you want to know? It's the key to answer prayer. It's the key to seeing things happen in your life from God. God's not trying to keep it from you. God's got it from you. He's created it. He's made all these things for you and I to enjoy. How do we get it from Him to us, from the vending machine into our hands? For it is by grace you've been saved through faith. Grace makes, faith takes, faith receives. Matthew 21, 22, write this down. If you believe, if is a conditional clause, it means you don't have to, but if you do, if you believe, you will receive whatever you ask for in prayer. Ooh. What do you mean, Pastor? I can go to God and ask, and I believe God is going to do this thing for me or for my loved one, and all I have to do is just keep pulling and keep having faith and keep, keep my faith alive and keep believing I'm receiving, and it's just a matter of time before that thing falls down and comes out the bottom and I just pick it up and take it. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir, that's what exactly I'm saying. If you believe it, you'll receive it. Faith, faith takes, not by works, watch this now, so that what? None of us can boast. Look what I did. Look what I did, right? But watch this now. Paul goes on to talk about Ephesians 2, verse 10. For we, someone say that's us. For we, talking about the church, we are God's workmanship. So we're not saved by works, but we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do what? To do nothing. If you look at most Christians today, you know what they're doing? They're doing nothing. That's not why we've been created in Christ Jesus. That's not why we've been saved. We've been saved. We've been created in Christ Jesus to do what? To do good works. Now, here's a kicker, which God prepared or planned in advance for us to do. See, God's got some things for you and I to do, corporately as a church and individually. There's things that God has for you to do that I can't do and no one else can do but you. It's true. And God's got things that I need to do that you can't do. God's got different plans and purposes for all of our lives. They're individually and uniquely tailor-made to us. Amen. And God's prepared it. Let's just bop down to Jeremiah 29, 11. Can we do it? Someone say, do it, Pastor. God said this, for I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you, to give you a hope and a future. Then you will come and call upon me and pray to me. And when you pray and seek me with all your heart, I will be found by you. See, God's got a plan. God's got a purpose for your life. God's got a work for you to do. Or, he, or when you were saved, he'd have just taken you to heaven. Why does God leave us here after he saves us? Because everything we're doing on earth, we can do better in heaven, in, including work. You're going to work in heaven. Now, I'm out of a job, so I'm going to sit and watch you work. That's what most of you are doing right now. You're watching me work. I can't wait. I'm going to sit down. I'm going to go ahead, brother. Help yourself. <laughs> I'm out of a job. <laughs> We're going to be servants. Matter of fact, everybody in heaven is a servant, including the angels of God. We're servants. We're here to help people, serve people. 1 Corinthians, i got to hurry. 1 Corinthians 15, by the way, listen, just take it easy. We're not going to get done with this message. We're going to, it's going to be continued, okay, next next week. Don't, don't, i got a lot of ground to cover, and I'm quickly losing time. 
1 Corinthians 15, 58 says this, always give yourselves fully to doing nothing for the Lord. Doesn't say that, does it? Paul said, always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know, someone say, I know, that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Isn't that good news? Everything you and I do for the Lord, it's not in vain. God sees it. God's going to reward it. God's going to applaud you for it. And we're to give ourselves fully to the work of the Lord, to what God has called us to do, what God has called you to do. That's what we're to do. We're, to, we're not just to worship, if I can say it this way, we're not just to worship fully, we're to work fully. Come on now, some of you know what I'm talking about this next week or this, past, uh, this next week. Last week, did you work fully? Or did your employer get 75% of your energy? Boy, that would have been a heck of a week. 50%. I wonder how many people that go to work Monday through Friday are really working fully. I'm just going to give 25% today to my boss. Come on now. Let's be truthful. Let's keep it real. We're to work fully for the Lord, right? We're to give all of our heart to God in worship. We're to give all of our heart to God in our work. We're to do everything we have working, working for the Lord. Because our labor in the Lord is what? It's not in vain. John 5, verse 17. Now, this is an amazing scripture that the Holy Spirit led me across this past week in my study. Jesus said to them, them meaning his disciples, Jesus said, my father is always at work to this very day. And then Jesus goes on to say, and I too am working. Well, my land, if God's working... And if Jesus is working, what do you think we as His disciples are so, supposed to be doing? We're to be working. We're to be serving the Lord. We're to be, and how do you serve the Lord? By serving others. How do you really love the Lord? By loving others. How do you help the Lord? By helping others. That's how you do it. Jesus said, whatever you've done to the least of these, my brethren, you've done it to who? You've done it to me, Jesus said. You've done it to me. See, whatever we do, we work, we work, my land, God's working, the, Jesus is working, and the Holy Spirit's working, and the Holy Spirit is working through who? Working through you, working through me. Colossians 3, look at this with me. Talking about working for the Lord. We're to be working between now and the rapture of the church for the Lord. Colossians 3, whatever you do, that's pretty open-ended, right? I mean, whatever is pretty broad. Whatever you do, Work at it, here it is, with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters, not for human bosses, since you know that you'll receive, here it is, an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. Your boss might not ever reward you. Your, 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 your uh, uh, manager, your CEO might not ever reward you. Might, you might not ever get that bonus. But God sees it. And God's going to reward you. You will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. Why? Because it is the Lord Christ you are serving. Isn't this amazing? We can go to work for our bosses. We can go to work for our companies and our employers, whoever it is. We're working fully, and we're working as unto the Lord. God, because, you know, your boss can't see everything you do. Your boss can't hear everything you say, but Jesus can. God can. And, and he's going to reward you for it, right? Amen. Galatians 6, verse 10, goes on to tell us, talking about working for the Lord. We, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people. So who are we to do good to? Who are we to be helpful and kind and compassionate and helping to? We're to be good to all people, amen? People that are worthy and people that are unworthy. People that are nice and, come on now, let's be real, people that are not so nice, right? People that are appreciative and not so appreciative. We're to be good to, right? That's what it says. As we have opportunity, let us do good to all people. Now watch this. Especially, the Apostle Paul says, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. We're to do good to all people. But we're to especially do good, listen, my, my brothers and sisters, to one another. 
Because when we are good to one another as Christians, brothers and sisters in Christ, children of God, you know what it is? It's a witness to our world. It's a witness to those who don't know the Lord. Wow, look at how they love one another. Look at how they serve one another. Look at how they help one another. Look at how they forgive one another. Look at how they surround one another in times of trial and times of pain and suffering. Wow, I want to be a part of a community like that. I want to be a part of a fellowship like that. And our love for one another, our goodness to one another draws them in as a testimony. And they get, they get touched by what? The agape love of God. The unconditional, unmerited favor of God. Love of God. Amen? It's to, it, we're, we're to do good, but we're to do good especially to those who belong to the family of believers. We like to say it this way. Membership has its privileges. How many of you have ever heard that? Membership has its privileges. Amen, it does. If you're a member of this church, you have certain privileges that non-members don't have. It's true. It's true. Number one, you have access to the body of believers. Amen. We're in relationship with one another. Hallelujah. We're to do good. Hebrews 10, 24. Oh, I like this. He says, let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Now, how many of you have rode a horse? Some of you, some of you know what I'm talking about. You've got, we've got some horse riders in here. And, uh, and, you know, the old cowboys used to have spurs on their boots. And, and when they wanted to get the horse up and going and moving and galloping and running, you know what they did? They spurred. They spurred the horse. They put those spurs deep in the hind legs of that horse. And what'd that horse do? Well, I guess we got to gallop now. I guess the cowboy wants me to run. No. Boy, that spur, it kind of sparked them. I mean, the harder the spurs went in, you know, the quicker they, they got to going. What are we to be doing, brothers and sisters? We're to be spurring one another. We're to be saying, hey, come on now. Man, I'm preaching. You're, I'm trying to, what am I doing right now? I'm trying to spur you. I'm trying to spur you to worship. I'm trying to spur you to working for the Lord. Come on. I've, I've said for, for going on 10 months this year, it's time for all hands on deck. It's time for people to get out of the grandstands of Christianity and onto the playing field of ministry and to get to working because the Jesus is coming back. He's coming back soon. And very soon. And, and, and our time is running out. And, and here's the thing. And the, and the time is running out on them. Out there. And we need to be spurring one another on. Amen? Amen. Towards love and what? Good deeds. Good deeds. Encouraging one another. <laughs> spurring one another in the Lord. Hebrews 6 verse 10. says God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love that you've shown him as you would, as you've helped his people and continue to help them. See, God's not going to forget you. God's not going to forget your labor of love. God's not going to forget your work. God's not going to forget your act of kindness. God's not going to forget. Let me say it this way. God's not going to forget your generosity in giving financially. There's three ways to give to God. Are you ready for this? Write this down. Your time, your talent, and your treasure. It's the only, thing, only three things you can give to God. Your time, your talent, and your treasure. What are you giving God right now? You're giving Him your, your time. You're giving God your time. When we work for the Lord, we're giving Him what? Out of our talents. What God gave you, you're giving back to Him. And then your treasure, your money, is, is, is working for the Lord. It takes money to do ministry, and it takes more money to do more ministry. Amen? We are only able to do phase two because you gave. That's it. We had that vision. Didn't we have that vision, Jim Browning, years ago to be worshiping back there? It wasn't a lack of vision. It wasn't a lack of planning. It was a lack of money. Because these contractors like to get paid. They're saying, well, 
will you come and work for 40 hours for free? No. <laughs> but I'll come work for 40 hours for $50 an hour. Well, <laughs> I can't give you $50 an hour because people haven't given to the church. Are you with me? Are you seeing this thing? So when you give to the Lord, God sees it and God turns money into ministry. And, and we're able to serve. You don't know this. We give thousands, I mean tens of thousands of dollars as a church to, to homeless shelters, food banks. I mean, we're, 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 we're taking that, not just for us. We're not just, you know, building a, a better building here. We're, we're using it to help people. When you give, your money goes to things like that. Amen. We get letters all the time. Got one this past week. Thank you. Thank you, Tabernacle, for giving to the Lord. Amen. And God's going to reward you. 1 Peter 4.10. Is that where we're at? 1 Peter 4.10. Each of you, now he's going to talk about the individuals here. Each of you should use whatever gift you've received from God, right? Talents that you've received from God to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. See, you and I can't do everything, but we can do something. God's given you talents, gifts, and abilities uniquely to you. Whatever that is, it's a great clue as to what God wants you to do. People say, well, I don't know what God wants me to do in life. Well, I do. Let me help you. Take an inventory of what God gave you. That's what God wants you to do for Him. A great example of this is, is, is a guy, I might not get his name right, in the Old Testament. Probably a name in the Bible you just skipped over. You read it once and the Holy Spirit just quickened this to me. It's the guy that God blessed with construction talent to build the temple. I think his name's, and again, forgive me for not getting this right here. If I'd have known this was going to go, I would, I would have done my research a little bit better, A.B. <laughs> I think his name was, is it uh, Benaiah or Belal or something like that. He was given, the Bible says about this guy, he was given uh, talents and gifts to build. And guess what he did? He built stuff. <laughs> he didn't preach a sermon. He didn't lead the worship. He just built stuff. And he built it for God. And he built it for people. Amen? If your gift is singing, what do you think God wants you to do? Sing. If your gift is playing an instrument, what do you think God wants you to do? Play an instrument. If, you ever, if your gift is, you know, baking coconut cream pies... Pastor Tim would love to be a recipient of that gift. <laughs> some of you can cook. Come on now. Some of you know what I'm talking about. It's not that hard. We make this harder than what it is. God gives you the gift. You use it. And by using it, he rewards you for using what he gave you. There was a day and time someone said, come on to me, man, God gave you a big mouth. <laughs> I think God can use your lips. I think, I think you could probably be a preacher. You never shut up. I'm like, wow, that's, that's genius. Come on. Pete's a counselor because Pete does really good at listening. I do really good at talking. We are great brothers. I mean, I talked all the time. He listened. That's what he does. He listens to people. I help train him. <laughs> he couldn't get a word in edgewise. <laughs> Dear God, I got to get paid. I've been listening to this guy this whole life. <laughs> Use what God gave you, amen? And God will bless you for it. And it will be a blessing. See, God made Eric Little fast. And when he ran, he sensed God's pleasure. I, I, I can only tell you, and you know, some of you know what I'm talking about. When you're doing what God created you to do, it's not work. It's pleasure. 
It's a joy. It's easy. It's just like, man, this is, I, this is easy. And you make it look easy because God gave you the gift to do it. God gave you the grace to do it. And if someone else was trying to do the thing you were trying to do, they'd, they'd struggle. They'd have a hard time at it because they weren't gifted or talented Come on now, to do it. But you have been. Last verse. Revelation 22, verse 12. One of the last words Jesus ever spoke that was written down in the, in the Bible are these. Behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me, to give to everyone according to his work. We talk about Jesus coming, and he is. He's coming. I believe we're the generation that's going to see him come. But he's not coming empty handed. <laughs> he's coming with rewards. He's coming with rewards to be given out to you and to every one of his disciples, every one of his followers. And he's going to reward them for their labor. Let me say this in closing. The reward will be worth the work. See, we're working right now. We're to be working for the Lord right now. It's not always easy. It's not always enjoyable. It's not always fun. I get that. But the reward will be worth the work. Can you say that with me as we close today? The reward will be worth the work. One more time. The reward will be worth the work. It'll be worth it. And you'll be so glad. And, 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 and he's going to reward you for everything you've ever done for him. Jesus said it this way. Even to the giving of of a cup of cold water, one shall not lose their reward. Wow. God's seeing everything we're doing. God's hearing everything we're saying. And he's going to reward us for that. So we've got to be worshiping. And my friends, it's, it's all hands on deck. It's time to be working. Jesus said it this way. Jesus said, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. The har There's plenty of work to be done. There's plenty of things we need to be doing for the kingdom as we're occupying until he comes. The problem isn't there isn't a, anything to do. The problem is there's not enough workers to get it all done. And you know what I hear the Holy Spirit saying? And I'm, I'm really sorry that I've gone over our time limit today, but this is burning hot on my heart. Time is ticking, and it's time to be working. It's time to get going for Jesus. It's time to, my land, if you've ever invited anybody to church, it's, it's time to invite them to church. If you've ever done anything for the Lord, it's time to do that. You know what? We have, we have ministry teams in this church that we're, we're needing people to work in. We're needing people to, to serve in. Children's ministry, we need more workers. Worship ministry, media ministry, connection. I mean, every, every ministry, we don't have enough people working. It's time. And if the Holy Spirit would quicken your heart and say, you know, God gave me this gift and ability, and, and I would like to put it to use. We would love, we would love to, for you to do that at this church. At this church. And God's going to reward you for everything you do for Him. Amen? But all this begins, all this begins by what? By receiving Him into your heart and life. By making Him your Lord and Savior. Watch this now. This is, this is the dangerous part. Don't do the work without the Lord. Don't work for the Lord without the Lord. You've got to have Jesus in your heart. Amen. You've got to have him on the throne of your heart. And that makes working easy. So I want to give you an opportunity today to make Jesus the Lord of your life. Can we do that today? Would you bow your heads with me and close your eyes in prayer? And if you're here and you would say, Pastor Tim, I would like to make Jesus Christ the Lord of my life. Would you pray this prayer out loud with me today? Dear God, I come before you this morning, a sinner in need of your grace. Forgive me of all my sins.
Come into my heart and life. Be my Lord and Savior. And help me be a witness for you all the days of my life. And help me work for you all the days of my life until you come for me in the rapture of the church. This I ask and pray in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen and Amen and Amen. Would you put your hands together? Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Well